Oh, it's been a long week. Man, this one had some ups and downs. Uh, last week, I ran the half marathon, as a lot of you know, out in Las Vegas. Uh, I was a little slower than I wanted to be. Um, both times I've run this half marathon in Vegas, uh, about 10 miles in, my feet just start killing me. Um I, I really don't know the exact reason, but I, I speculate that it has something to do with the type of ground that you're running on. There's a lot of concrete that you run this thing on. It's a bummer. I was I was kind of feeling sick. I was fighting off a sinus infection. Um, but the first 10 miles, I was cranking through it. I think it was probably one of my fastest 10-mile runs ever. Um, but then at the 10-mile mark, I just had to slow down a bit. Um, I ended up finishing about eight minutes slower. Than I was hoping for. Um, might not sound like too much, um, but if you run half marathons, you probably know that's almost, or actually it's a little over half a minute, I think, uh, slower per mile. Um, so, you know, it was what it was, um, but I spent the rest of the week in Vegas. I was sick. Um, in Vegas, you know, to be honest, this time in Vegas was a little bittersweet. Um, Vegas without money sucks. <laughs> um, it really is the land of excess, and it's hard to really do anything there on the cheap. Um, but don't get me wrong, um, I'm in Vegas. I, I really have nothing to complain about. Uh, you know, so it, it was a tough week. I broke down a little bit while I was out there. Um, been dealing with a lot of stuff back home. Uh, you know, plus I was there with my parents and, you know, parents, even with the best of intentions can sometimes make you feel certain ways. Um, everything's good now. I did end up, um, missing our Fort Wayne show. The guys actually played the show without me, which is awesome. I mean, the fact that they were, were able to pull that off cause I don't like canceling shows. Um, and they were able to do something without me, which is just great. And I owe those guys for that one. Um, I tried making the show. I ended up missing my flight, leaving Vegas. Um, just re reasons that, uh, you know, whatever. I missed my flight. Let's just put it that way. Um, but I'd still tried to make it. Um, I got on another flight um, a little bit later in the day. Um, flew into Chicago, got my car, tried to make the drive. There's some weird, weird traffic on the freeway. It was like the whole thing just wasn't meant to be that day. Um, there was at one point there were four cop cars, like just driving five miles an hour, literally five miles an hour down the freeway, blocking all lanes of traffic. Still don't know exactly what they were doing. All I can assume is that they were looking for something, um, but they were they were at it for it took at least a half an hour before they finally cleared the way for everybody to start moving again. It was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. Um, so those guys did the show without me. Um, I, I owe them for doing that. It's pretty funny that the band is you know they keep joking. You know it's the Miserables named after my last name, but I wasn't there. Um, but it goes to show that those guys can do stuff that's just amazing. I mean they're super talented. Um, we, and I, I apologize for how my voice sounds. I'm still a little bit under the weather. Um, it's been a long week, so I haven't fully recovered from all this yet. Um, we did Indianapolis the next day. Uh, it could be a really cool space where we played. It used to be called Indy's jukebox. Now it's called the fifth quarter bar. Um, it's in a weird part of town. I mean, it seems like every part of Indianapolis I've ever been to, I classify as a weird part of town. Um, nothing against the people in Indianapolis. Everybody there has always been super nice to us. It's just one of those cities I don't really understand the design of. Uh, Saturday, um, we had a really good time. Uh, Saturday, we recorded a new music video um, with Natasha and Kevin from Gold House again. Uh, this is going to be for one more day off of the album. Uh, it's a short song. Video is going to be really quick. It's a little bit of a different idea. Um, I would say that this one is, you know, a little bit more my brainchild this time around. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested to see how it comes out. Um, and I'm always excited, you know, to see what, what Natasha and Kevin come up with when they send me this stuff. It's always a lot of fun. Um, it's not going to be out soon, though. This is going to take a few months for us to get out. The holidays are around the corner. Um, everybody's going to be busy over the next couple of months. So it's going to be some time, hopefully early next year that this actually comes out. Um, 
last night we played in Detroit, and man, I, I just love going back to Detroit and playing there. We did a Sunday night show at Logger House, and it was just awesome. Uh, the bands are great, and and Detroit, everybody there just brings it every time. That scene, look, Detroit's a tough town. Not just the city, but almost anywhere around the city as well. Logger House is right downtown, though, in, in Corktown. Um, and, and the way people bring energy out, it just amazes me every time. Nothing is handed to anyone there, and maybe that's part of it. Since nothing is handed to anyone, they've, they've got to make it themselves. Not, and I'm not talking about like career-wise. I'm talking about each moment has to be made by the people there. It's, it's not manufactured by some machine. Uh, they, they can only do what they can do. Um, you know, I've, I've been a little down on a couple of things about back home. Long story. There's some stuff happened. I feel like somebody let me down a little bit. I'm not going to get into it. It's really actually kind of stupid at the end of the day. Um, and it's not something I was interested in doing anyway. So who cares? But what happened last night just reminded me, you know, those indie DIY shows in Detroit are, are the best out there. Um, it's, it's not some big spectacle. It's just people get into a room and they release some energy. Um, you get great music from the local bands and, and everybody just has a good time actually out to see a show, not to stand there and be some voyeur or something like that. They actually participate in the show. You know, logger house has two rooms. Um, the music room is pretty small. Um, but everybody that's sitting at the bar, as soon as the band starts playing, 90% of the people in the other room come into the music room. Um, and it's not like there was a ton of people there. I'm going to say that grand total, there were 40 to 50 people there, but logger house is really small and 40, 40, 50 people feels like a pretty good crowd there. Um, so it was a ton of fun, man. Um, you know, Chicago, I'm just going to get this off my chest because I've been thinking about it. Chicago could take a serious cue from that. I mean, I love Chicago, but let's face it, man. You know, this is the home of pitchfork. It's there's a lot of manufactured bullshit that happens here. And I feel like there's a lot of that voyeuristic attitude in this town. Sometimes like people just want to be at the show because they want to show their face, not because they're actually interested in seeing a band or anything like that. Um, I don't know. I'm not. I I love Chicago, but yeah. I, I don't know. I'll let you guys figure that one out. Um, so even Dennis and I in this chat, you know, we talk about Detroit, and and there's a respect there that I think any musician that spent any amount of time playing in or living in Detroit really really learns to appreciate. Um, so getting to that today, I have Dennis from Eighty Eight Fingers Louie on. Uh, the chat was a little weird going in. Um, you know, our practice space, I, I don't know if I've talked about this before. I've definitely posted about it online. But we have this guy in our practice space. He's in the room right next door to us. And look, I'm not one to judge people, but this guy shows up. All he has in his room is a guitar amp, his guitar, and some paddles, and a microphone. And he goes in. And he cranks the volume on everything. And he starts playing basically nothing. I mean, it's just noise. It's noise, and he starts moaning, and he starts screaming. And he does this about 45 minutes every single day. Um, I don't know what it is. I mean, we've we've been trying to speculate on what this dude is doing. This might be some kind of therapy for him. Um you know, I, I really have no idea what it is and I, and I don't want to judge, but the one thing it does do is it makes our room during those 45 minutes completely unusable, especially for any sort of recording because it bleeds through. I mean, I'll give you guys an idea. I'm just going to, I'm going to play a clip of this. Yeah. 
See, it's wild, right? Um, you know, I, I, that was recorded just on my cell phone while sitting in our room. Um, no door open or anything. That's that's everything we get inside our room. I mean, look, again, it's it's a practice room. People can make as much noise as they want. I don't sit there and judge the death metal band down the hall when they do it. Um, the only thing is, is that they're down the hall and there's enough shielding between us that it doesn't get us it doesn't get in the way of us doing um, recording in our room, at least not to an extreme case. Um, who knows? Who knows? Um, so anyway, Dennis gets there, and this guy starts right when we get into the room. Because of how loud it is, um, we just couldn't do the podcast in there, so I had to rent an hourly room downstairs. Um but I didn't have my mobile rig with me, so I had to bring my whole desktop rig down there. So set up and break down, and we only had an hour to do everything. So we had to keep the chat to about half hour, 40 minutes. Um, so we didn't get a whole ton in there, um, but we got the stuff that I really did want to get, um, which is the 88 Fingers Louie history. Um, 88 Fingers Louie has a lot of uh, controversy, so to speak, um, or or rumor surrounding different breakups and reunions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it was, it was fun to get Dennis's perspective on it. Um, I think I even brought up at one point, it says in their Wikipedia article that they broke up once because uh, Dennis urinated on Glenn, uh, their drummer, uh, which uh, he says is not true. Um, I'd love to get Glenn on sometime and, and see what his side of the story is. Uh, but it, it's a great context because 88 Fingers Louie has a reunion show coming up. It's going to be with the Bull Weevils. It's on December 21st. It's December 21st. It's at Concord Music Hall. Um, it, and, you know, man, I, I haven't seen 88 Fingers Louie in, in a long time, so it'll be great to check this out. Um, but let's get to it. This is my chat with Dennis. everyone just um, tell me how you got started with the band thing 88 fingers Louie all that kind of stuff okay um, long time ago in a galaxy far far away um, I had met up with um, the guys uh, Joe at least who went on to be an 88 fingers um, Met him through a college friend of mine, and he said college friend introduced me to Joe and to the guys in the Bull Weevils. And um, from going to a couple of Bull Weevil shows, that turned into a couple of hangouts. And I think Daryl and I were talking about this the other day. I think the seeds for the actual like tryout for the band was like New Year's Eve, 92, going into 93. Um, Joe had mentioned that the band that he was working on was looking for a singer, and my buddy Eric um, said, yeah, I'm all over it. And uh, Eric said, hey, I think they're practicing by you. And I was living in the northwest side of Chicago. They were practicing in Park Ridge, which was like a hop, skip, and a jump for me. And uh, he's like, you should come out to practice with us. So, uh, or to the, you know, the tryout. So I went with him. And uh, <laughs> I love Eric, and I, and I, I talked to him a couple times a year. But he... Uh, he tried out with, I want to say, one Screeching Weasel song, one Descendant song, and I can't think of the other one, but he sang so much faster than than the music, uh-huh. uh, and he was getting like beat red, and I think after like two or three songs, he's like, I'm done. I can't yeah. do it. And, um, you know, guys are like, oh, that sucks, dude. I'm sorry. And then Eric turns to me and goes, well, you should give it a shot. I go, I... I don't know how to sing. I've never done this yeah. before. He's like, come on, I've heard you in the car. You sound great. <laughs> and uh, I actually had a bit of recording experience uh, before that. Um, when I was 12 years old, <laughs> I, uh, the family went down to Nashville. and Oh, tell me this is some kind of family recording. Close. <laughs> we were at the Opryland in Nashville, and uh, there was a recording studio in there. Oh, my gosh. And so keep in mind, 12 years old, I'm, yeah, yeah. so I'm 12 years old in 1984, 85. I have, um, jeans, jeans, very, you know, uh, I was, I think I was wearing my t-shirts, you know, with the sleeves rolled up a little bit and I was going through a big Motley Crue 
uh, no. face. This would have been theater of pain era Motley Crue. Okay. So um, I've, uh, my brothers and I uh, decided we were going to go to this recording studio. And uh, I said, let's go in there. Let's all do smoking in the boys' room. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and they chickened out at the last minute. So they pushed me in the uh, vocal booth. I sang smoking in the boys' room to, you know, a shitty backing track that was clearly not the original version. And uh, for like 20 bucks, I got a copy of it. <laughs> and up until probably 10, 15 years ago, somebody in the family actually had the copy of it. Oh, but man. we don't we, know where we can't it is find now. it anymore. Oh, that's a bummer, dude. So <laughs> that was my. So I digress. I actually had some recording experience before that. But other than that, I mean, I, I knew I could carry a tune, but I never gave any thought to singing. Uh huh. So they're like, well, do you want to sing anyway? I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll give it a shot. So we did, I think, the same songs that Eric did, maybe a Peg Boy song on top of that. And uh, they said, I can't remember if it was that day or the next day, they said, hey, um, it sounds good. Do you want to join our band? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm at this point, I'm 19 or 20. Um, and I'm like, yeah, sure, guys. And, you know, I remember going home and tell mom she's like oh cool i'm like yeah i'm I'm sure we'll play like some friend's basement pretty soon it'll be cool she's like oh cool good luck with everything don't forget that you have to get a real job you know (laughs) typical stuff um and uh yeah we so from really from about april of 93 um actively uh started doing music with them okay um was in my very first like real recording studio i think by june of that uh that year um and uh yeah it's been all right do you play any instruments or anything or just uh, just sing no i sing i uh i can you know i can find a uh you know melody on a keyboard like if i you know i used to have one of those casio sk ones where you can sample your little thing oh yeah and um, I think everybody had to have a Casio keyboard of yeah, some form at one when point. they were younger with the drum beats. Yep, <laughs> yep. I used to do this thing where, because they had a little built-in sampler, I would do this thing where I would snap yeah. and then speed it up and it made have it sound like Have you heard like this shit? Um, uh, so Greg Graffin actually demos all of the Bad Religion stuff on a keyboard. What? Really? Yeah. No, I hadn't heard that. So, yeah, you can go online... And you can listen to all of it, <laughs> like these old demos of Bad Religion, and it's like, and he sings it like normal, yeah. Like he sings it like Bad Religion style, but but it's all like eight bit sounding keyboards <laughs> behind it, dude. You gotta look it up. Oh, I do. I was listening to it. Somebody pointed it to pointed me to it the other day, and I was like, this is hilarious, dude. <laughs> it's like it's totally like Nintendo music. <laughs> Bad religion, but the real thing. So now they do all these eight bit things, you know. And yeah. I'm like he was doing this back in the day, dude. Does he do Wacho and Sika while he's playing the keyboard too? His uh, little, uh... I, I I can't remember, dude. I was just laughing. <laughs> I'm just trying so to picture hard. <laughs> Space Invaders music with Greg Raffin <laughs> over the top. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Um, so so eighty eight fingers, Louie. You guys started in early nineties, yep. and then you guys you guys put out quite a few records in a short time. Then. Yeah, we did. So, on my memory shot, but I think ninety th- in ninety three itself, we did the f- first seven inch that we did um, on our own with a label that we mm-hmm. started with the Boyles, and then I think the end of ninety three we had the first fat seven inch. Um, so two two seven inches in ninety three. Uh, ninety four was the second fat seven inch, and I think. Late ninety four to ninety five is when, like the, um, a lot more uh, releases came. You know, mm-hmm. like a couple ten inches, uh, a couple split seven inches. There, um, ninety five was the year I think we had more. What labels was, did you guys work with? Fat only, or you no? Guys we did a couple labels, right? Well, we did the the whole fat thing came out um, completely. That again, similar to how I joined the band, was completely, um, you know, sheer coincidence or sheer luck. Uh, yeah. We had been demoing uh we're not demoing we were recording stuff with the intention of putting out another record on our own and we had been big fans of what was coming out of sonic iguana and um i can't remember if it was joe or yeah joe must have suggested we book we record there and we liked the way that whatever queers record had come out at the time um and then obviously the screeching weasel stuff mm-hmm. and uh we did like i think it was like five or six songs um that again we were going to just Put out ourselves, or at the time we were looking at a couple of local local labels, 
and unbeknownst to anybody, he sent a demo to Fat. And he said that he ended up saying something after the fact. He's like, hey, just so you guys know, um, I said something to Fat Records. We're like, why, why would you do that? We're, <laughs> Is we're this band- mass you're talking about? What's that? Is, was this Mass? No, no, Joe. Oh, Joe. Joe, okay. um, Joe actually did this. We okay. re- the stuff that we recorded with Mass, he sent the Fat. Yeah. And uh, we're like, dude, why, why would you do that? We've been a band for like six months. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's, it's clearly obvious we're a band that's been together for six months. You know, yeah. I feel like I'm going through puberty singing. Like, no uh-huh. one's going to pay attention to this crap. And he got... He got a call, I don't know, a few days after they rec- they received it, and uh, Fat Mike called him up and said, I want to I wanna work with you guys. Awesome. So Joe, <laughs> Joe calls me. He's like, I, I, I got some great news, but I don't want to tell you uh, over the phone. I got to tell you in person. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, okay, what? He goes, we got to meet for pizza. That was like our, our, our big thing. We always had to have band meetings over pizza. And uh, so we went to like the local pizza hut, and he had tears down his eyes, and he's like, yeah. Fat Records wants to work with us. And so I was like, <laughs> what? He's like, yeah, dude, we're going to be on the same label as Propagandi. I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. All right. Cool. And then so we did so we did the first seven inch on our own uh, on Go Def. We did two seven inches on Fat. After that was a couple of splits. We uh, recorded a bunch of more songs at Sonic Iguana that we thought were going to be like the first full length that we were going to do on Fat. Fat passed on those. We ended up recording with another local label, Rocco Records, run by some friends of ours. And that turned out to be this um, toting 40s and fucking shit up 10-inch that we did. And um, then we started writing songs for um, what became our first album, Behind Bars. We sent that to Fat. He said, it sounds good. Can you change a couple of melodies around? And I, at that point, I was getting kind of confident in mm-hmm. how I wanted my voice to sound and the melodies to work. And I... Said I didn't want to change anything, yeah. and we through actually through Mike he hooked us up with uh, with Lewis and Darren at Hopeless Records, okay. and they said you know this stuff sounds perfect to us, we'll put it out. So um, from Fat we went on to um, Hopeless Records for the rest of our I guess mm-hmm. recording career. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so then you guys split up in. 98? <laughs> we split up a few times. Yeah. We split up in 96. A rocky, rocky yeah. road. <laughs> yeah. We split up I in... Think on, I think on Wikipedia, your Wikipedia page, it says that you urinated on Glenn. Is that mm. what it says? Mm, yeah, well, that's Wikipedia. <laughs> I didn't urinate on anybody that I know of. Um, you should check it out, dude, because I'm pretty sure that's what it says. God, you know what? <laughs> that's fine. If it makes it more interesting. No. The, what happened was in 96... Um, so my son was born in 95. Uh-huh. Um, I got married in 95 as well. And I, I think I was naive and thought that I could be married, be a young dad, and still play music, mm-hmm. whatever we were calling full-time at the time. Um, and it just became increasingly harder and harder to justify getting away and yeah. going on tour. And, um, and I didn't handle it very well, rather than like sit down and tell the guys, hey, can we maybe not do this tour. I need to yeah. spend some time at home. I went out and, you know, when I would get an earful from my kid's mom, I went in turn scream at the rest of the guys in the band. And, yeah. you know, you can only take some of that, so much of that BS for so long. And yeah. we, uh, we started a tour with Good Riddance and I think we got about 10 days into it. It was supposed to be like six weeks. We got about 10, 10 or 12 days into it. And the guys are like, we can't stand you anymore. <laughs> like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> So uh, we called it a day in 96, and then somewhere in 96, I split up with my son's mom at the start of 98, and I think I started working on music right after that with another band, uh, just a couple of practices here and there, and then I think I ran into Joe or Dan at Delilah's or Exit or something like that, like maybe a month later, so we're talking like March of 98, and I half joked around, I'm like, all right. I'm not married anymore. I can tour as much as possible. Hmm. And just joking. And I talked to them either that night or the next night, the next day. And they're like, so yeah, we've been doing this band and we're not sure if we like our singer. We're thinking mm-hmm. about just putting the kibosh on that. And what do you think about doing the band again? And I was like, yeah, all right. If we don't do it now, we'll probably never do it. So yeah. um, John, who was our third drummer in 88, he was playing with those guys at the time. They're called Nice Guys Finish Last. And, um, he, you know, we, we met up, I was living out in the far Western suburbs at the time. They come out and we had a little meeting and they're like, you know, what's it going to take to know that you're going to be into this, you know, full time. And I'm like, well, I'm like, 
you know, I don't necessarily come with any demands, but I have to know that when I come home, I can't break even. I've got a kid to, you know, yeah. support. So with that being said, you know, we, we, we budgeted our money a lot better than we did probably the first go around. And from about spring of 98 through summer of 99, it was, it was awesome. And then <laughs> summer of 99, I um, decided um, I'm kind of tired of touring. Um, I was dating somebody at the time and just didn't want to be on tour all that, all that often. And I started making a couple of suggestions that maybe we didn't need to write a record right now. Like mm-hmm. we had already had the back on the streets, the second full length, we had put out the kid dynamite split that everyone was into. And I thought, all right, well, you know, why don't we wait six months? And dudes weren't having it. They were demoing <clears throat> new music. And we went on this tour and again, not really talking about it beforehand. Um, I, you know, started eating, when we'd stop for food, I would, you know, I would eat across the highway from everybody else and <laughs> just dumb, passive aggressive nonsense. And then, um, <laughs> and then things came to head. We were actually supposed to start a tour with AFI in, I think, Portland. Portland or, yeah, Portland. And we got about halfway into the drive and it was just miserable. And I think at one point they turned to me, they're like, are you, do you still want to do this? I go, I don't want to do this right now. I want to go home. I want to, take a break and um, let's work on music, you know, in a few months, let's be normal people for a little bit. And yeah. it's like, screw you. We've got all this momentum with new stuff. You know, <coughs> you're bringing the band down again, mm-hmm. you know, you're dead to us. So we broke up, <laughs> we broke <laughs> up, turned around, went home and uh, they, uh, they took a couple of the songs that we were going to write for the new 88 record that became the new, the first rise against record. And then, um, you know, I went off and did Story So Far with Jeff Dean, and those guys did Rise Against, and they got slightly more popular. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this this go round is um, our first. Our, this will be our first show with Joe on bass since we split up in '99. Uh, so okay, and you guys have done shows since then, though. We did Dan, Dan and just I different lineups. Yeah, Dan and I and John, the last eighty eight drummer, we. Um, for our ten, the ten year anniversary of our breakup, we said, "Hey, let's. We're all getting along. Why don't we try and do some shows?" And we reached out to Joe, and he's like, "I, I'm, you know, I'm too busy with Rise yeah. Against." He's like, "But, he's like, I'm totally cool with you guys doing this. Just make sure you don't get a bass player that's terrible." Yeah, you know, we got a friend of ours, John Contreras, who did a really, really good job, and you know, we had fun doing those shows. But, you know, I can only speak for myself at those. That that y- you start realizing, like, okay. We're playing a bunch of songs that this dude didn't play on, and it's weird looking at that side of the stage and seeing a great bass player and a great dude, but not Joe. Uh-huh. So after I think we did, we must we must have did about ten shows, and we finished uh, with a show with the Bullygles at the end of 2010. And I just said, you know, I think it's enough. Mm-hmm. So um, when the idea of this 20 year thing came up. Um, my thought with that was like, if it's going to be, it's got to be the OG lineup yeah. or I don't want to do it. So. so who's playing drums? Um, it'll be John, our last drummer. Uh-huh. He'll be playing, um, cause he played the majority of the 88 stuff. He'll be playing most of the songs, but, um, we've got, uh, Glenn and Dom, both of our drummers, um, uh, before John, um, on board as well. And they'll be okay. doing a handful of songs as well. Well, that's cool, man. So it'll be awesome. So how did this whole thing come together? This show, like, was this your idea or was this like a, Riot Mike suggestion? Or, no, actually, yeah. um, no. It's actually it's it's kind of funny. I I think it's a year <laughs> this month. I started thinking I'm like, okay, you know, we're in November two thousand twelve, two thousand and thirteen. Holy crap, we're old. That marks twenty years <laughs> since we started playing. That's like insane. That's like yeah. Led Zeppelin to me. Like you know, yeah. dinosaur rock. And I think I'd I think I'd said something. Must have emailed Joe or something like that and said, dude, I know you're gonna be busy, but Let's play. A, let's play a show, you know. And uh, in uh, typical Joe fashion, at least back then, he took forever to get back, and mm-hmm. I think it was at least a month, if not longer. And I was like, "All right, that's that. Sh- that ship has sailed." Mm-hmm. And then um, this past summer, um, Joe picked up the ball and said, "All right, I'm serious. I've got some time. Um, let's 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 make a go of this um, while we can." I'm like, "All right, cool." And um, God, 
uh, Dan on board. And of course, we met. We didn't meet for pizza this time. We met for uh, food out in Logan Square. And um, I had realized that there was some tension still between those two over Rise Against. And I thought, well, for once, it's, there's drama in the band. It's not my fault. Like, <laughs> I'm in the clear. I'm like, I'm like the angel of the band right now. So when it was obvious that there was some, um, there was some stuff that, that, that still needed to get worked out, we kind of put a, a pause in that conversation um, to the point where I thought, all right, well, again, it's second try. It's probably not going to happen. Yeah. And then um, out of the blue, I got an email from one of those guys saying, all right, I just, we just hatched it out last night for about four and a half hours. Um, we're good. Let's do something. Okay. So um, we, you know, I don't know that we were 100% sure we were going to do a show. We had to get together to see if, uh-huh. if it was weird or not. And it turned out, you know, as cliche as it sounds, it, 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 it felt like, you know, it was 1999 all yeah. over again. Like we just picked up where we left off. And um, it's funny, you know, I think Dan and I have a better grasp on, you know, how to play our, our songs than Joe had because Joe probably hadn't played an 88 chord in, you know, 15 years at that mm-hmm. point or 14 years or whatever it was. Um, and knowing that he wrote these intricate bass lines, it was funny to see him yeah. like pick up his bass and be like, how the hell did I come up with that <laughs> line? Or, I don't know, expert, but figure it out. <laughs> um, but, uh, so once we figured out, all right, we we're we're sounding good. We should we should make a go of this. Um, we utilize the services of uh, Ride Fest, or um, I'm sorry, uh, Rise Against um, booking agent, who in turn was booking for Rise uh, for Ride Fest. So it was kind of a natural conclusion that we'd end up working with with Mike and those dudes. So mm-hmm. um, we literally the day that we uh, announced the show, I think we had just um, booked it maybe a week before that. So everything kind of came pretty quick. Pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. Um, so in between 88, you had story so far, which yep. you did with Jeff Dean mm-hmm. and then you had explode and make up, right? I did. Uh, well, there was explode and make, or sorry, uh, story so far from about from 99 to my time was 2001. I think they, they, uh, carried out another year with Rick after me. Um, and then in 2003, um, I got uh, coaxed into work with some guys in a band. We, they called themselves um, Undercast, which is a crappy name. Um, but the music they were doing was really good. It was kind of uh, more like the thrice techie kind of uh, new okay. lead guitar stuff. And I was into it, but uh, personality-wise, there was no there was no way the band was going to yeah. go anywhere. And so that. That was probably about maybe eight months altogether, a handful of shows. We recorded a handful of songs, and um, believe it or not, our biggest, probably our biggest supporter of our music at the time was Justin. Mm-hmm. He's like, what's it going to take to put out an undercast record? Yeah. I'm like, really? I don't think anybody cared, but he's like, I want to do it, dude. It sounds great. Talked to the guys, and they're like, we don't want to record with a record label that we've never heard of. I'm like... No one's knocking down our door, and this guy's a good friend of mine, so fuck <laughs> yeah. off. I, and, I, and it essentially turned into, if you guys don't record with my friend Justin, then fuck off, I'm done. Yeah. And I was like, well, let's see what other options are. I'm like, all right, fuck off, I'm done. Yeah. And, uh, and then in nine, or 2005, um, Jeff, I think Jeff had, the story, if I remember correctly, Dean had uh, recorded a bunch of stuff that was going to be the... Um, what was that band? He, this is terrible. He's going to give me so much shit for forgetting. The band that he was doing, Four Star Alarm, I think it was. And they had recorded a bunch of stuff up in Toronto with um, with John and uh, with John Drew. In, Back when he was still at Single Noise, then probably. Yeah, that was it. The studio was awesome. That was it. That was it. Yeah. And uh, But um, he recorded a bunch of hardcore songs, just uh-huh. screwing around in between takes or whatever. And he took couple of these songs that he was screwing around with and he's like what do you think about bringing it back old school and i'm like me and you in a band together you sure that's a good <laughs> idea he's like come on dude we've grown up i'm like all right i'll give it a shot and he played me this stuff at my uh at the house i was living at the time and i was like this shit's really good yeah. let's let's do it and then uh we got pete miller on board and pete's a guy i've known longer than anybody uh-huh. i've known pete since i was in high school i think pete whether he wants to admit or not i think we've got about 25 years that we've known each other and uh just the idea that I was playing with this dude that I've known forever was that was just icing on the cake for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
uh, Exploded Makeup was like my main, that was like the only band I was doing for a few years. And then, you know, we uh, eventually stopped doing, you know, shows on a regular basis. And now we're, we're lucky if we play a show once a year now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Jeff Dean is in 30 bands. Yeah. So how much time is he going to have right. for each one? I mean, you know, and that's fine. I mean, we, in, the, the, the cool thing about that. In, I, I don't think it's a WoCast episode if somebody doesn't mention how many bands Jeff right. Dean plays. Right. <laughs> I swear it happens in every single episode. Because everybody brings up a Jeff Dean band. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, it's, he's like, it's, it's, it's the whole six degrees of Kevin Bacon. It's six yeah, degrees exactly. of Jeff Dean. Yeah, exactly. Somebody out there, every musician out there, has at one point or another either been in a band with Jeff Dean or has recorded with Jeff Dean. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely, um, you know. But I'm, I'm the 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 commitment or lack there of of exploding back up. The the thing that makes it great is you know Pete, Jeff, myself, and and Mike Etch. We're all awesome, you know, real good friends. And it's like we'll get together again. It's not mm-hmm. you know the, Jeff put it pretty pretty succinctly a few months ago. He's like. This band's never going to break up. We yeah. not, we might not play for two or three years, but yeah. there's no point in breaking up because you break yeah. up when you hate. You know, it's like a relationship. Yeah, when you don't no longer get along, that's when you break up. We've never not gotten along. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good way to look at it, man. That's an optimistic take yeah. on being in a band these days. That you know, you take some time off and exactly come back and do whatever you want to do at this point. So, right. Um, so what's what's in store for eighty eight fingers, Louis, after the show? That's a good question. Um, I know that Rise Against is um, in new album mode. So I think probably from the start of 2014 through at least spring into summer, that's going to be Joe's main focus. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked about doing other shows. If if it lines up correctly, we'll do them. If not, then, hey, we'll, we'll make this one show as, you know, the best it can be. Yeah. Well, it's uh, dude. I'm looking forward to it, man. That's yeah. That's taking it back. I, I had to have seen you guys. I know I, I've been to an 88 Fingers Louis show back in Detroit back mm-hmm. in the day. It was probably. It must have been towards. God, I can't remember. It, it must have been like 95 or 96. That's when I started going to shows pretty okay. heavily. So it was around there. We I there, I don't remember at this point. But, <laughs> you know. Um. I my. My, uh, uh, um, I've, I've always had a good time playing in Detroit. Detroit, as I'm sure you hear from people that don't, aren't from Detroit, Detroit can throw a lot of people off. It's like fucking Detroit. Yeah. Um, I have that opinion. No offense to anybody from St. Louis. I kind of have that opinion about St. Louis. Like fucking St. Louis. Really? Um, and a lot of people, I, you know, a lot of people probably have that opinion about Detroit and it was like, oh, we're going to play Detroit. Cool. And everyone's like, we better bring your gone you better bring this you better bring that um and we've always had great shows in detroit we i think we've always well, especially played in the 90s yeah the, the 90s in detroit that whole scene was just yeah. we must have played spot on i would say in our heyday of doing shows whether it was nine in the early 90s or late 90s we would play the shelter yeah and oh yeah. that's probably where i saw you yeah the, the the best part about playing the shelter is i can't they don't like do normal shows there anymore. No. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to Ramona, the girl who does Black Irish booking. Mm-hmm. She does most of the booking out there, and she's like, "Yeah, nobody does the shelter anymore. Yeah, like, it's, it's still there, but nobody plays. No one's doing it. No punk bands, at least, play shows there." We had we had uh, made it a point um, after finding out how much a lot of these <laughs> clubs were taken in merch percentages. Mm-hmm. We're like, I, "We're not going to play a club that does that." You know, yeah. we're, we weren't trying to be fugazi, but at the same time, we're like, "There's no reason why." People should pay fifteen dollars for a T-shirt. Back then, yeah. ten dollars, you know, is more than you know, more than fine for a T-shirt. Mm-hmm. And I think it was one of the first or second times that we played the shelter. Um, we were told, okay, yeah, well, you know, they're going to ask for five percent or whatever the mm-hmm. the the markup was, and we're like, we can't do it. Yeah. You know, we can't do it. They're like, well, you know, tickets have been on sale for so long. You know. Um, It'd be really shitty if you guys cancel the show. I'm like, yeah. I'm not saying we're canceling the show, but we're gonna sell shirts if we don't sell them in the shelter. We're gonna sell them outside uh, outside the shelter. Uh, whether you guys sell them in the back alley yeah. there in the shelter. I mean, we're literally yeah. in, in 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 my head. I'm thinking, sure, we might get our asses kicked by you know yeah. people that run run this place, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna charge fifteen dollars for a shirt that just says eighty eight fingers loose, yeah. a black shirt that just says eighty eight fingers loose. It's ridiculous. So. 
uh, we were setting, I think we were getting ready to bring our stuff in and somebody in security came up and they're like, we heard you got a problem with uh, selling your merchandise here. <laughs> and we're like, well, yeah, dude, it's, you know, why, why spend, why pay you guys extra money uh, to sell uh-huh. shirts? It just doesn't make any sense. I'm like, there's got to be a better way to approach this. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, maybe it was the security manager for that night or whatever said, Tell you what, you just set up everybody um, in security with an ADH shirt. We'll uh, we'll call it even. There you go. So that was like our bribe every time we played shelter. <laughs> after that, it was all right. If we got a new T-shirt design, <laughs> let's set aside a dozen shirts for the crew, and there we'll uh, we'll get to sell our shit for yeah. For 10 man, bucks. I miss the shelter, dude. That that place was grungy as hell, but yeah. it was a good place to go see a show, man. I think I played there once. Yeah, but it was it was already kind of. On the on the outs at that point, mm. um, yeah, you didn't you just never hear about anybody playing there. Even St. Andrews, you don't really, which is the upstairs. St. Really Andrews, St. Andrews. I got a couple of funny stories about St. <laughs> Andrews. Uh, so we got to play St. Andrews once. We were yeah. op- the opening band for uh, Pennywise and the Joy Killer. Um, so we must have did that in ninety ninety four. I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they were. I think Pennywise was doing the Unknown Road at the time. So we must have been ninety four. And um, it was awesome. Like, by, I think at that point, it was definitely the biggest show we ever played. Yeah. St. Andrews was, that was the place to yeah. play yeah. Back, back in the 90s. Oh, yeah. Like, if you played St. Andrews, it was like the biggest deal in town yeah. to get a show there. So. Um, so that was awesome. And I think it was the next time through we played the shelter again, but we got there early. And um, this is when Cheap Trick were doing their albums. I think mm-hmm. they were doing like In Color from start to finish. They were okay. touring, touring that. So we get to the, we get to uh, the shelter early. Um, we're loading our stuff in, and then out of nowhere, you see this white minivan pull up to pull up through the alley. And a couple of guys get out, and they just they just look like they're you know uh, uh, dropped off from like 1975. Just completely, <laughs> just like you know, we were cool once, we're not cool anymore. Yeah. And we're like, oh, who the fuck are these guys? And this one dude comes out, and he's just, he looks like Skeletor, uh-huh. just like, or the Crypt Keeper, just yeah. really just like, Bleh. and he's like, hey, guys, sorry, I hope we're not uh, cutting you guys off. We're like, no, no, that's cool. We're just loading in. He's like, cool, cool. You know, um, what do you guys call, you know, we we're talking about the band or whatever. He's like, cool, have a good show. I think we're playing upstairs tonight. And it turned out it was Robin Zander from Cheap Trick. I'm like, oh, Holy so shit. you put a lot of makeup on us to <laughs> look that good, because... Dude without makeup was was a scary a scary scary sight, but uh, we got to sneak upstairs. Um, well, I should say I got to sneak upstairs yeah. while we were playing, um, or after uh, right after we played, while the rest of the guys were unloading gear. Um, I snuck upstairs and I got to hear him do a couple of cheap yeah. trick songs. So that's awesome. That was cool. Yeah, I miss I miss Detroit back then, man. There there were so many good places to play back then, and it's just that whole scene is it's still great. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but. Um, it is a little bit different, but we did last year. We did this whole Black Christmas thing. Mm-hmm. And Suicide Machines played, and the Break Anchor played, and it was hilarious because uh, they did a Break Anchor played in the Garden Bowl, okay, which is where we played. I don't know if you ever been there before, no. Magic Stick Majestic. So there's like a bowling alley. Oh yeah, so yeah, I'm sorry, like, yeah, yeah. I've been it's kind of like Fireside, you know. It's very reminiscent of that. Yeah, um, and you play kind of in the front, right by the entry door, and. Uh, I came downstairs from one of my buddies' bands playing, mm-hmm. and Break Anchor was playing. I literally couldn't get into the garden bowl to see Break <laughs> Anchor. It was just packed as could possibly be. Oh, man. And I had to run out to the car for something anyway, so I step outside. And as I'm walking out, I'm peeking in the windows and looking in. Yeah. And uh, I see Jeff Dean <laughs> stand there. He's standing on top of a table looking. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what he's looking at. And then I finally get his line of sight, and yeah. there's like a... There was a Christmas tree in there, yeah. and it was now in like eight pieces. Like the oh, kids shit. in the crowd had literally just tore the Christmas tree oh. apart. Dude. And Dean just looks at me through the window and he's like, ah, <laughs> "Stuff know. happens, dude." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I so. think he was like, "It's Detroit." It's dude. Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Detroit, do what Detroit yeah, man, folks do. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm bummed out. Uh, Jay, this is probably won't be a secret any longer. Um, or maybe it will be. Uh, <laughs> I, I got eighty eight got asked to do Black Christmas this year. Oh yeah, and we, we had to say no because I know at least a couple of us are going to be out of town. Yeah, um, but uh, that would have been fun. I I'm I'm glad I, I got to play uh, Magic Stick. Um, I hope with either Exploded Makeup or somebody else, I'll get mm-hmm. to play Magic Stick again. But we got to do uh, Magic Stick with Hellmouth um, 
when uh, the second Hellmouth record came out. I guess it was a record release show. And uh, we played there and we played... Oh, that was the only Detroit show we played with them. We did, And then we did um, Milwaukee with those dudes. Um, and I... I Jay Navarro is a dude that, you know, I was a huge Suicide Machines fan um, for a long time. And when I started playing with uh, with Jeff in the story so far, you know, he's, you know, built in fan base of uh, Jay Navarro. And I think we did it, our first show or maybe our one of our first shows with, with the Suicide Machines. I just remember thinking, like, how does a dirtbag like that <laughs> sing so awesome? Because, you know, you know. And I, you know, I say, you know, me, two hundred some odd pounds of blubber now. Um, it just it, it it shows that like guys that you think are just going to be like just complete destitute, just <laughs> whack jobs, turn out to be like the some of the coolest fucking people. Yeah. Like I'll I'll uh, I'd, I'd kill for Jay Navarro. I would I would shoot a dude in the face for Jay. Navarro. <laughs> that's that's how much I love him. That's one of the best lines ever. I would shoot a dude in the face. I would shoot a dude. I would. Jay Navarro. I would totally would. I love that dude. Yeah. No, man. And Suicide Machines back home are still crazy. Everybody comes out for that stuff, especially over the holidays. So, um, yeah, that's a good time. Hey, apologies for the little edit here, um, but we were actually going to shut the conversation down, but then we started talking um, about my conversation with Daryl and... Um, Daryl from the Wool Weevils, but there, we got a couple of little cool bits here. I wanted to include them that we caught after we shut down. Um, so I'm going to include that, and that'll be the actual end of the chat. So here we go. Yeah, I mean, like the Daryl one, I got to add so much stuff. Just like we went to all kinds of tangents. Just an hour on his, uh, on his um, medical experience alone, I imagine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which that shit is crazy, man. Yeah. Physician, Did he tell you the story about how he got his car? How he bought his car? Yeah. I should have. We should have waited till we were still recording. But uh, so the running joke was, and I. Well, here. Let's get it. On. <laughs> Let's get it All right. Here. I'll throw the mic back. <laughs> still going. All right. We're not done recording yet. All right. Uh, Daryl Wilson, I don't care if you hate that I'm bringing this up. But I'm going to bring it up anyway. <laughs> so Daryl. Daryl's coming to get you. <laughs> Watch out. Omar's coming. No, Daryl's coming. <laughs> Um, so let me preface this by saying Daryl is the reason why I'm singing in a band today. I, mm-hmm. I look up to Daryl like not only like a, a, like a big brother, but you know one of my best friends. Um, but we, you know, we 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 talk. We don't hang out nearly as much as we used to. We had a good time at the Dickey Show last weekend, um, and we were reminiscing about some conversations that we've had over the years. And one of the funniest ones I had with him is we were talking about putting together some sort of musical it wasn't even a band it was like almost like a <coughs> one time only like variety thing and it, mm-hmm. needless to say it fell apart but he had <laughs> we were about 45 minutes from the conversation he's like hey I gotta let you go my Porsche is here what? and I'm like what? the Porsche what are you talking about <laughs> don't you still owe like 600 grand in student loans so he got off the phone with me and I never understood why um you know, I never understood. Like, I got the full story there. So we're out last weekend, and I said, "All right, dude, let me." Add. And it could, you, now that I think about it, it might not even be a Porsche. It was definitely like a very Holy rich God. car. Yeah. You know, maybe a Lamborghini for all I know. But anyway, this hot car, expensive car. I said, "Dude, you never finished the story. What the hell happened that night that we were talking on the phone?" He goes, "Yeah, um, so I was in Vegas uh, with some friends, and somebody put me in touch with a uh, broker of some sort, and." Um, I told the guy I was interested in this sports car. And he goes, all right, well, you know, how much can you put down? And without batting an eye, Daryl goes, I'll put cash down 100% right now. And um, the guy goes, okay, well, I don't have it here. It's in probably somewhere on the East Coast. He's like, that's cool. He's like, um, I want you to, because I'm putting cash down, I want you to waive the <laughs> transportation fee, you know, which I'm sure was probably a cool yeah. couple grand at least. And he's like, all right, you drive a hard bargain, but that's cool. I'll do that. And apparently he was at the dealership while we were having this conversation. <laughs> and out of nowhere, he just says, my Porsche is here. And he, goes, and he goes, literally, I was staring at my new car while I was trying to get off the phone with you. I'm like, well, you're going to send me off the phone like that. At least make it for a good reason. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. as good a reason oh as any. Oh, my God, dude. I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. like. I'm just trying to picture 
eight and a half feet tall Daryl Wilson <laughs> trying to sit down in one of these damn sports cars. Dude, one of the funniest things is the first time I think I met you. Oh yes, was that Beat Kitchen? I was all sloshed. Yes, dude, and I looked at you. I'm like, oh yeah, man, you're the dude that sings for the bowl yeah. labels. <laughs> and you look at me and you go, yeah, I'm not a six and a half foot tall black man. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I was That's right. Just dying. I was like, oh shit, wrong well, man. Well, you know what's funny is I think when I, when I, I don't know if it was <laughs> Dean introduced us. Somebody yeah, introduced us. Yeah, it, it, it was a Jeff Dean show. I think. Yeah, uh, I can't remember which band was playing. Uh, was yeah, no, they have I don't think it was All Eyes West. It was before All Eyes. The West, bomb, maybe? maybe. Was it maybe the bomb? the bomb? It had to. Have, God, that must have been like three or four years ago. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. I remember thinking right around the time <laughs> you said that. I think I even said something to Jeff. If, if, if not Jeff, then then after somebody, I was like. Some douchebag from the copyrights <laughs> thought I was <laughs> thought I was uh, Daryl Wilson, <laughs> and they're like, "Which douchebag are you talking about?" And I pointed out to you, they're like, "He's not the copyrights." I don't know why. Do you do you know somebody in the copyrights? No, I don't know those dudes at all. I don't know them all either. But for mm-hmm. some some reason, maybe I met somebody in the copyrights that day. There's something in the booze that night. Yeah, <laughs> everybody's just getting bands yeah. wrong. <laughs> copyrights are from you know Southern Illinois or from Detroit. Yeah, yeah. get that stuff more. Incorrect. Yeah, yeah. Well, it happens, dude. Dude, that was hilarious. No, I just remember sitting there going, "How did I fuck that one?" <laughs> well, you know, if, if if we would have lined it up and we would would have interviewed Daryl and I at the same time, like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first thing out of my mouth once once the tape was rolling, I would have been like, "So, Joe, I'm Dennis, eighty eight fingers, Louie. That's Daryl." <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, That's alcohol. Good, yeah. Oh, my God, dude. Uh, and plus alcohol, beat kitchen, Jeff Dean shows. Right. It adds up after a while, man. <laughs> All right, dude. Cool. I, I got to turn the room back over to this guy. So Short but sweet, eh? Um, I do want to have Dennis back. Um, I'll talk to him about that. Um, next week, the Miserables will have another cover tune-up. Uh, last week's was a whole lot of fun. We've been getting a great response from these things, and I really want to thank everybody that's been out there supporting this. It was kind of a wacky idea. We're trying to stick with it as best we can. Um, so we, we've done two of these. The third one is coming out on Monday. Um, I hope you guys continue to enjoy this. Uh, the band is talking about recording another album. Um, ho- hopefully we make that happen sooner or later. Uh, other than that, that's all I got for you, man. Uh, Mizzy out.